I'm Becky Hart, the Vicki and Kent Logan Curator of Modern Contemporary Art here at the Denver Art Museum. And it's my pleasure to participate with my colleague Florence Mueller um, on a panel, How, Does fashion, How Do Fashion and Art Respond to the Past and Present Visual Cultures? Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Sarah Thornton, who will speak on the topic of appreciation and currencies of cultural value. Thornton is a writer, ethnographer, and sociology, sociologist of culture who was born in Canada. She lived, though, for 25 years in England. She has a BA of Art History from Concordia University in Montreal, a PhD in the Sociology of Culture from a uh, university in Glasgow, and has had uh, academic posts at the University of Sussex and Goldsmiths University of London. She took a, a little hiatus from her academic, uh, travel, her academic career and began to work undercover um, doing ethnographic research as a brand planner for an international advertising agency. And it was during that time that she realized she needed to return to her first love, art. And she started doing research on the culture of contemporary art. Uh, she was the chief writer for, for contemporary art at The Economist, but she's best known for her book, Seven Days in the Art World, published in 2008, and for her two other books, uh, uh, Seven Days was preceded by uh, Club Cultures, Music Media, and Subcultural Capital, and after that she wrote a fascinating book about artists, 33 artists in three acts. Sarah now lives in San Francisco with her family, and she writes for Cultured and Architectural Digest. She's a noted panelist uh, and a spokesperson for contemporary art, whose perspective is valued throughout the, throughout the contemporary world. I know that she is fascinated by the world of fashion and de design, so I'm just thrilled to welcome her here today. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Thornton. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've learned so much already today. And you will hear echoes of Glenn Adamson's keynote speech from this morning in mine, insofar as I start <laughs> with this slide. And um, luckily, it is a different um, image uh, than the one he used. I will be talking principally about appreciation and a lot about market values because, of course, money talks very, very loudly in our culture. And um, I was not brave enough to really dive into all the difficulties around the term appropriation. I do use it once later on, but um, I will focus on appreciation. Whoa. Yeah. Um, so here we have a definition, a feeling or expression of admiration, approval or gratitude, a sensitive awareness, recognition of aesthetic value, judgment or evaluation. So those are kind of three shades of the same thing. And then there's a, what is positioned here in Merriam-Webster as an entirely different meaning, but of course is contingent on the first, and that is an increase in value. So here we have an image in which uh, clearly Yves Saint Laurent appreciates Mondrian. Uh, Mondrian died in 1944, so when I say Mondrian appreciates Saint Laurent, uh, I, it's not because the man himself appreciates Saint Laurent, it's that the work of art <laughs> increases the value and the perceived stature in our cultural hierarchies of Saint Laurent. So that's 1965-6. And then 1966-7, who comes along but Campbell's Soup. And uh, so on the left, we see the, the women and their bodies are kind of elevated into art objects. They assume the position of kind of odd sculptures in their positions. Unlike the gal in the super dress, uh, which is riffing on Warhol, but mentions him nowhere. Um, but of course, he stole the Campbell soup can without their permission. So fair's fair in the game of war, I guess. Um, uh, she 
you know, just looks like a chatty teenager ready for some wholesome Campbell's soup for lunch, uh, at least in terms of the way she's presented. So, uh, uh, when I think of the term appropriation, okay, I'm using it a little bit, uh, the first artist that springs to mind is Warhol, uh, post Duchampian, who basically uh, took images from other people and used them all the time, generally without apology. Here we have the publicity photo by Jean Corman, uh, taken uh, in 1953 in relation to a film she did called Niagara. So I don't think Jean Corman owned it. It's probably 20th Century Fox owns the rights to this picture. He was just a hired technician, really, the guy who took the shot, or maybe a bit more skilled than that. Uh, Marilyn dies in August 20, uh, 1962, and uh, Warhol very quickly uh, creates a whole body of work with Marilyn and her image in rock replica. And I think one of the things that hasn't really, gender came up a tiny bit in the last panel, but I, gender is one of my big things, I guess, as a lifetime feminist and lesbian. And I think one of the things that um, occurs over and over again is that women's images, women's faces are appropriated very often to sell things. And they are the, their bo whole bodies are kind of emblematic of beauty and they, uh, that, there's no, there's really rarely a discussion about that they own them at all. Uh, the only time you get into conversations like that is when you're talking about uh, choice, issues around choice and uh, uh, the right to life. Anyhow, deep backstories are a key part of what bring value to uh, artworks. And um, so one of the very weird things about art is the who owns it impacts on its value. This is called provenance. You know, so when Yves Saint Laurent, after he died and there was a sale of works from his personal collection in Paris, a high premium was paid on all those decorative objects and paintings because they'd been in the hands of and in the collection of Yves Saint Laurent. So provenance is one of those odd issues, but also what happens to a painting is exhibition history impacts on its value. How many times was it put into catalogs, that kind of thing. Sometimes the impact of a uh, something that happens in the life of the canvas is such that it even gets integrated into the title. And that's when you know you have a backstory that has shifted the meaning or contributed greatly to the meaning of the work. And so this is Blue Shot Marilyn, and you might be able to see that she has a hole between her, uh, a discoloration, in, you know, between her eyebrows. And that's because uh, a member of Warhol's crazy entourage uh, went into his factory, his studio, in 1964, when the, uh, this series of works, there's five 40 by 40 Marilyns at this scale, were leaning against the wall and shot through. And there's a lot of debate whether she thought through two of them or four of them. But anyway, it, given that this is a picture about death and a memento mori and the fact that this actual gunshot penetrated the picture, um, usually this would be a disaster for the work, a conservation issue, something that would devalue it greatly. But given the circumstances, it actually made this series of works the most expensive Warhols that you could buy the most coveted and historically the ones that traded for the highest prices. You know, as the Orange Marilyn, a sister to this one, traded at 17 million in the 90s. Um, so we are talking a lot of money. So, you know, in the recycling of images, uh, what often happens when things go global is they lose their backstories and they, they become, I, I think of thick images and thin images. And, um, you know, the, in the previous slide, the images are relatively thick. Marilyn's death is 
present. It's well known. Her, her, you know, she was living one minute, she's dead the next. Um, Warhol Studio, he was alive. There was a lot going on in the Times. The Versace dress is posthumous. Um, Warhol died in 87. Uh, the Madonna appropriation is, uh, she looks tired. One could say it's tired, too. Um, and then um, I didn't even know who to attribute this dress to because it's on sale through so many different online retailers that I wasn't sure who'd made it. <laughs> and I think it sells for about 49 bucks. So personally, I'd rather wear it than the Versace. But, you know, um, one of the issues, you know, t that often comes up in relation to these things is... Uh, a gesture towards Walter Benjamin's seminal essay from the early 20th century about the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. And I actually think he got a lot of things wrong, because how could he really understand it? Um, but certainly, um, the, the issue of aura would seem to be relevant here. Now, when you're looking at the value of Warhol's work, um, it is important to look at subject matter. So Marilyn became his most expensive subject matter. And then after that, you'd have a tier of secondary celebrities like Elvis Presley and Marlon Brando and Elizabeth Taylor. And then maybe under that, you'd have uh, Jackie Onassis. And then you'd have different bodies of work, like the flowers. He made so many of those. They were decorative, never going to be as expensive. And one of the things that was really at the bottom of the barrel for many, many years were his Maus. And this 1972 Mao, I talked to Bruno Bischofsberger, uh, the guy hosting uh, Basquiat and Warhol in the original poster. Um, I interviewed in, him in Switzerland for The Economist when I was writing a piece about Warhol. And he said that when he first showed these in Switzerland, he didn't sell a single painting. And he then put them in a garage that wasn't even locked and left them there for a decade, still not selling a painting. And so it was a great shock to the to art market insiders when this particular piece made a record price for Warhol in 2006. And the key thing to note about it is that it really announced the arrival of the Chinese as key buyers at the high level of the auction market at Sotheby's and Christie's and places like that, because this particular work was bought by a Hong Kong billionaire. And then I skipped through from Hong Kong to Japan. <laughs> Um, but I, in terms of my own research, I've done a lot of research on Takashi Murakami over the years. He appears in Seven Days in the Art World, and I've um, written a, about his collaboration with Louis Vuitton, at the time interviewed um, Mark Jacobs, who was the artistic director there. And um, when I first saw this painting, I was totally astonished. I thought, oh my god. Murakami has lost his mind. What is he doing putting LV logos in on a canvas? Has he ceased to be an artist, a contemporary artist? You know, has he become a designer? Is he making wallpaper? I mean, what's wrong with him? Anyhow, um, but I, I slowly uh, came to understand that um, in many Asian cultures anyway, that Fashion brands are as high ranking as contemporary art in many circumstances. And so there's more a marriage of equals in the eyes of many uh, uh, cultural participants in Japan, let's say, or China, than uh, the hierarchy, the standard hierarchy we would have in New York. Um, well, yeah. And so uh, the Vuitton, uh, Louis Vuitton Murakami collaboration actually lasted 13 years and uh, was very successful by many accounts. And I think partly due to the kind of true collaboration you can see going on uh, in the bag on the right. The bag on the left is much more typical of like, let's just stamp a you know, an iconic image from the artist's work on the handbag. And, um, but on the right, we have Murakami kind of invading the logo. And so this multicolor uh, really revived Louis Vuitton. And Florence can correct me because she knows way 
way more about fashion than I do. But um, I think it really relaunched Louis Vuitton's uh, handbags and rejuvenated them because, of course... Um, age is a key part of these the, this kind of trade. And I'm not going to say very much about uh, Yoyoi Kasama, except to say that uh, I think Vuitton was lucky that she was such an amazing pattern maker because when I interviewed her in the studio, it was absolutely clear that she was not really engaging with the project. She's lived in an insane asylum across the road from her studio for many years, and she... You know, she certainly engages with others, but I think it would have been difficult to, for her to, like, fly into Paris and deal with the design team on the handbags. Um, uh, you know, so this is much more of a, an application of her work, t which um, uh, I, th you know, had... Um, uh, commercial success, and I think artistic success in its own way. I mean, there's an aesthetic... Um, there's a sympathetic relationship, given the fact that Kusama worked with clothing in the 60s, often used textiles, and, um, and is a kind of uh, masterful abstractionist. And the Vuitton co um, collaboration definitely rebounded well on her and appreciated her in the eyes of the general public, because subsequent to this... Um, hitting the shelves at uh, Barney's and elsewhere, uh, she became the blockbuster uh, museum artist. So when she was in Mexico City, there were, her retrospective, there were people around the block. And Kusama has since become one of the most famous artists in the world, not to mention the most expensive woman artist. So, uh, you know, my way of getting out of the appropriation issue uh, is, is partly to talk about collaboration, as others have today. And I think you can think of collaboration as mutual appropriation, and hopefully um, it's not one of domination. And I think Warhol, when you look at these works, and they have become possibly my favorite Warhol works now, I find these this body of work endlessly fascinating. And actually, Bruno Bishopsberger had a whole warehouse of unsold Basquiat's Warhol collaborations only like six years ago. So um, they're, they're certainly not Warhol's most cel celebrated work. But, um, you know, the balance of things that Glenn already touched upon, you know, a certain kind of seniority and art gravitas, even though Warhol's reputation was, you know, very iffy by the 80s. He had become a bit of a celebrity portraitist and a lot of, lost a lot of his credibility. Um, I guess a way to go for credibility maybe was to go for street cred <laughs> with uh, a street artist. But you definitely have this combination of seniority and youth and commerce and authenticity, which you can see in the kind of the um, almost ironically authentic, primitive, quote-unquote, style that Basquiat chose to use, uh, the raw and the cooked. You have a really interesting, in my opinion, balance of concept and craft and kind of chaos going on here, uh, certainly a balance of subculture and elite culture, and fame being a really key ingredient in all of this. And um, I recently reread not all of it, but large parts of Vasari's Lives of the Artists, which is from the 1600s. And he is considered the original art historian. And he wrote about the lives of Michelangelo and da Vinci and uh, Raphael. And um, he himself was a painter. And what's really interesting when you go back to it is the number of times he refers to their fame for him, fame was almost synonymous with success and recognition and aesthetic importance. And in our culture, partly due to mass media, fame is a derogatory term that's in kind of antithesis to, like, real recognition of achievement. I would, I would think that actually the lines get very blurry and just like it's different, it's hard to distinguish a kind of... Um, the loving form of appropriation from the, uh, 
S&M version, <laughs> the dominating form of appropriation. So it is very difficult to distinguish um, different kinds of fame. But uh, I, I have now, I, I put the word multi-seasonal in partly because it's a fashion term, but I'm wondering, other than those of you who have seen this top, slideshow and maybe excluding Glenn. Does anybody remember the brand of clothing that Basquiat and Warhol were wearing in the poster at, for the first slide? Yes. yes. Right. I'm sure it's not an accident. Right. Appreciating, uh, appreciation, like one, the market is a platform, is a media platform, is a communications platform, did I say the media? I meant the market. The market is a platform. The market's a media platform, a communications platform, and one of the ways that artists today stay in our historical memory is through the market. And I often tell this to artists who hate the market and loathe the market, and they have every right to do so. But um, oftentimes, without the market, um, museums are our principal um, memory, but as we know, m museums today interact a lot with the market and their donors and things like that. So anyway, this is just a thought about um, the everlasting or lasting um, legacy of appreciation in all senses of the word for Warhol and Basquiat. And I think if anyone is worried about what happened to Basquiat, in this scenario and whether Basquiat was exploited by the seasoned Warhol, well, I just want to remind you that Basquiat got to have the last laugh because Basquiat is currently the most expensive mm -hmm. artist, American artist ever, and the most expensive post-war artist. And this is a piece that sold for $110 million to the guy who's pictured there, a Japanese billionaire, whose uh, Instagram tag is Yusaku2020. So there we go. Hello. <laughs> Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Carla Fernandez, um, who uh, will uh, talk to you about the fashion world. Uh, she has uh, founded her uh, fashion brand uh, in 2000, and she's uh, very, very well known for her new vision uh, and a new way of dealing with the, this fashion world. And uh, she has really inventing um, not only uh, uh, special design and, and all sorts of ideas, but she has also creating a new link between ancient traditions and uh, the fashion world. And she got a lot of recognition all around the world for this achievement. Uh, and one of these awards was, was the British Fashion Council that was uh, uh, really uh, saying uh, by given her this award that she has really invented almost a new fashion business model. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to introduce Carla. <laughs> First, I have to say thank you very much. Muchas gracias. I am very happy to be here with you. And um, I met Florence last year. Yes. And uh, for me, it's always an honor to be in a museum because as we taught not before, um, I work with a lot of Mexican artisans, and um, we do what they told us not to do. So mainly what we do is exactly what people told me and the people that work with design not to do. We work with different artisans around Mexico, mainly women that live in, in the in the highlands, in the deserts, and in the mountains. I have a, an amazing country where the haute couture is made by especially women that don't speak Spanish. So we had to create a pedagogy where we could understood in terms of, um, in terms of uh, design language. The first time that I went to the communities, it was um, crazy because the government of Mexico had, um, 
had this project that designers working together with uh, artisans. I was very young. I was 19 years old. And um, we all went up to the highlands. And we were uh, carrying our uh, tailor rules and our measuring tapes. Imagine, so it's crazy. So we went up there and they don't, uh, we have another way of living. So I threw out my <laughs> measuring tapes. I had to say to them, it's like, I'm so sorry. I was mistaken. You have to teach me how to do these amazing textiles that you have been doing for the last 3,000 years or 4,000 years. And it's very simple and it's very logical. Before I had started like the Mexican patterning, because I am a, I am a nerd of patterning, and we started doing uh, with fingers, um, cuartas, I don't know how you say this measurement, elbows, and um, we decided that instead of making hamburgers, we are going to be making tacos, you know, because in Mexico, they used to tell uh, me that I wanted to be a fashion designer. There was no career in fashion. I made the first uh, program 15 years ago, or yes, 15 years ago. And it was crazy that people kept saying that we did not have fashion in Mexico. And I saw the 68 different communities, language alive in my country, how beautifully they were dressed. And I say, it's like, but this is only comparable to La Croix, you know? The first thing that came to my mind when I saw a Masawa woman, it was La Croix, you know? Like all these beautiful details that you have, like this amazing skirt that when you see the women in her house, it's completely sober, you know, black, beautiful. And when she goes out to the sun, it has threads, silver threads that shine with the sun. So it's like, oh my God, no, it's like, what is this? So this is completely sophisticated and beautiful. And the other thing that working uh, on having the, the great honor to work with the communities, I learned that um, another way of fashion, uh, fast specifically, the fashion system can be possible. Now, as the markets and um, European and American and uh, Western, it's everything is about being so fast. And fashion is the fastest of all. Um, now, for example, Sara makes every two weeks new, co new collections, imagine. And brands like us have to compete with that. And we peel us from, um, I don't know, any place, purépechas, este, zapotecos, or can be taken two years. So when we say that we're doing exactly the contrary of what the fashion system is doing, is that we take time, and we do few, and we do it slowly. And that I learned from the people that I work with in the communities. And um, I just came from giving a talk in New York two days ago with an amazing artist, uh, uh, Benvenuto Chubajay. He's from Guatemala, and he's 100% indigenous Cachiquel uh, from Guatemala. And he was saying that when they see, well, if you see an Indian in Mexico or, uh, no, or in Guatemala, and his father used to say to him, if you see the Indians that are looking down, it's not because we are vencidos. Um, how do you say vencido? Surrendered. Surrendered. It's because we're looking to the land. And every day that I work, and I say it again, I, I understand the complexity of working in community, the complexity of looking at clothing, as culture, as an open book that tells the story of the women and that of herself and the community, and how different in in the Western we are, you no, know, like facing our happiness or facing what we want to do. So I decided when I started making clothing, I had two choices. I had a choice. Can we loop it again? Um, just to be inspired by it by 
my passion about uh, textiles or to work with the best of the best creators and uh, of my country. Obviously, who wouldn't say <laughs> no? Not to work with the best ones. And um, so, for example, we also collaborate with, uh, for me, it's very important that we do it in both ways. First of all, the communities call us to collaborate with them 90% of the time because they're not selling to Western markets. And it was told before in the, first, in, in the previous panel, for them it's very important to have, they do different things. They do their own wipiles that take two or three years to be worn. And then they do for the market. And that's how they get money in the house. They sustain a lot of them, their homes and their kids. Otherwise they have to leave and work in other um, officios, como se dice officios? Trades. Trades that are not as distinguished in the community. And, uh, and they leave their kids with the older kid that is 10 years old, and the grandmother, which also has a lot of work. So it's also a very complex situation that people have to leave because trades are not being um, sold and, and considered as art, you know? So at our workshop, we always say that we are just a um, medium, you know, to you have to understand the complexity of a backstrap loom, you know, uh, of how they really take care of their sheep or their cotton, go up to the mountain with eight sticks, they make a loom, they thread it, and they, six months later, you have a beautiful garment. It's crazy. So imagine how much knowledge they have. And for example, um, I work with, uh, together with Juana uh, Lopez, and she's an amazing uh, dyer. We have been asking three years for her visa. If you go to the Smithsonian, you see her dyeing. She's a master weaver. Um, and she doesn't get it. And she doesn't mind. But imagine how many um, like knowledge is being lost and not translated. So what we do in our uh, brand is that we um, do workshops, we do residencies, we do books. We have a, the, our last book. It's called The Barefoot Designer, a handbook. And it says how we work with the communities, how we pay for the work, um, what has worked for us and what hasn't. And um, it's like a bitácora, no, of work. And I just wanted to... Ah, and, and like the first photographs is also something very important. We work with different photographers. The last um, magazine we made, every season we make a magazine, so you know who made your clothing and all the, um, all the uh, f techniques and all these hidden stories that have to be told to the world, as the same as Hermes tells it very well, or, you know, um, or uh, Dior, or all these amazing brands that you see, these super handsome Italians like making the bags, you know? <laughs> That's the same way that we have to show and be very proud of uh, the crafts. And um, the first photographs were, uh, that I show were made by Maruch Santis. And we can show the video of San Laurent, please. Digo, sorry, about Dior. Maruch Santis is an indigenous photographer from San Juan Chamula, she's Sotzil. She's one of the first uh, women photographers and men, well, in her, in her country, well, in her land. Half of the, of the, of the people in her, in her uh, community don't talk to her because she became very famous. I don't know even if the museum has work from her, but she's at the Tate, she's at the everywhere. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that this is a very collaborative process. We stay in the communities and we learn from them. And we do uh, all the dresses and all the designs together. Obviously, there, we have some uh, that are industrial that don't have like the processes, but um, most of them that are called uh, ancestors, it's made with the communities. 
And then it's like, and we solve problems. Like for example, a lot of the um, crafts in my country are being extinguished. For example, the bracelets are made of the chocolate whisk, you know, and no one uses them anymore because they are last, meant to last forever. So we already have one in our houses. <laughs> and then, um, and now you go to the supermarket and you buy the chocolate in powder, in powder. So you don't need this instrument anymore. And there's like 4,000 artisans that are fleeing or quitting that amazing craft. So we went to the community because um, Don Juan Alonso asked us to, to do something together. I was like, Don Juan, but this is very easy. You know, you have the stick, you have the rings, let's make them bigger and we have bracelets. And one day after, we had like this amazing design that we've been selling in Paris, we're selling in the States, in Japan, and, and now there's a lot of trend in Mexico that you make buttons, you make earrings, you make shoes, and you know, so sometimes you, it's very good to have like that eye, you know, from outside to solve problems. And um, we can go now to um, the video that I wanted to show about Dior, um, that it's not here. This is how they make rebosos, which is super complex. Every line has to be knotted, and it's four kilometers of thread just to make 30 rebosos. And that's uh, how we make ikat in Mexico. And then you have to be very careful to take one uh, thread out and not to cut it. There's 13 different hands involved in making one reboso. And it takes two months to make these 30 rebosos if it doesn't if it doesn't rain, if it rains, it's two and a half months because they're made outside. Can I ask a question? Yes, while please. You're waiting? Yes. Um, yes, you, you are doing an amazing uh, uh, process uh, uh, of really reinventing uh, or bringing uh, old tradition into this uh, fashion world. Would you use instead of because this word was uh, was used so many times appropriation since we started the day, would you use more preservation? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in my opinion, and what has happened to us is that, in for example, rebosos. I started working with rebosos together with the with the Tenancingo, maybe twenty years ago, and it really. They were like uh, they were not many weavers because uh, that was it's a very hard work and very uh, difficult and so it was kind of static in a way and they had like the local market but the local market was also already satisfied and it was not paying uh, that much but we also have to be very careful on how to pay it, because there was an example of uh, trying to pay much more, uh, like also 20 years ago, for the rebosos, and then it cracked the, the market, the, the local market, because they couldn't compete, which was like the biggest market. So I think in making these efforts, and um, I always say that fashion is not ephemeral and tradition is not a static, which I'm wearing here. Can we do it? <laughs> And we also like make these uh, statements. Um, we talk all the time with our co work or co the people that we work with, you know. And I ask all the time to the communities, would you like to sell? What do you want to do? How do we do it together? Let's do it, no? And we sit down and listen. Okay, tell me, what do you want? Where? And they have a lot of clients. They have a lot of clients mainly coming from the States and from Canada, you know, that want their objects, but in another way. And for me, appropriation is when you don't do it with the person that makes it, you know? So when you do it exactly the same, but you don't give recognition to the person that made it, and you don't do it with them. You know, as, as we are all artists, and we saw in the previous um, panel, 
I mean, we saw appropriation, I'm sorry, but those boots are exactly the same, you know, and that is appropriation. But something else would have happened if they would call the artist and they would do it together and she would decide if she wants to do it or not. And we have the fortune to do it with people that want to do it. And we do it together, you know, and that's why it's called Taller Flora. And, um, and they not only do it with our brand, we give um, like the um, um, open source or we are there to help each other uh, so they can design new things and that's why we do everything with the squares and rectangles. We use the DNA of Mexican patterning. We don't use Western designs because it's very difficult to make hamburgers you know, <laughs> for us. <laughs> I, I want to ask, go uh, build on that question, and that would be, uh, Sarah, I, th I think that something that has been said to me, and I think you come across it in the, in the contemporary art world, how can you understand all these different artists, because each artist has their very own platform, and yet the platform in contemporary art, because it is a hot world right now, is a public platform. And can you talk a little bit about how artists choose their subject matter as a way of bringing to light a political uh, situation or, or, uh, or an historical situation? Because that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're respecting, uh, Carla, you're, you're respecting these histories and you're bringing them into uh, a public domain, really. Into, not a public domain, but into public conversation. And I think contemporary artists do this too. I mean, there are a, a lot of artists nowadays do make work with teams of assistants who have very specific craft skills, but a, a very small minority of them actually acknowledge them. And interestingly, Murakami is someone who the, all the assistants who works on the painting sign the back. That is very unusual. Um, he, I wouldn't call him a political artist, but someone like Judy Chicago, um, who's best known for her large-scale dinner party, which is at the Brooklyn Art Museum. Um, that w work is actually a... T that, it's not just a... It's not just about the plates and the runners. It's about the whole exhibition. And she didn't trust the institutions of the time, and I probably you couldn't trust most of them nowadays to acknowledge all the people that worked on the project. And so... Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, and so the thing is, when you enter, uh, there are p huge panels that talk about all the women who worked on the embroidery, all the women who were pa plate painters, and that kind of thing. It, actually, there were some men involved too, but uh, she relied on this huge force of uh, mostly female crafts women who um, kind of gathered through women's consciousness raising in the 70s and, um, you know, decided to participate in this project about women's art history and reclaiming, uh, you know, history was all about men and this was a way to reclaim um, women and uh, bring them to the table quite literally um, and so there are 39 women around 39 historically important women around this giant dining table each represented by a plate but um, so those are two things to spring to mind um, I mean Judy Chicago has not worked with the market much at all partly because that was the feminist you know, the market was evil and you didn't touch it and, and real artists weren't commercial and that was part of the debate, part of the debate at the time. I think that um, nowadays there are many politicized artists who use the market in various ways either for diverting money into projects, so someone like Mark Bradford in L.A. or Theaster Gates in Chicago, um, uh, you know, Andrea Bowers in L.A., they, they are activists in a lot of ways. You wouldn't necessarily know that from Mark Bradford's work unless you knew the backstory behind the way it looks, but, um, uh, yeah, so... 
I think that um, seeing a very strong end, the market doesn't like a lot of politics. You know, it's not going to sell better if it's anti-capitalist, but they're amazingly good with other kinds of politics, and identity politics is not one that is anathema to the market. Communism is, but that's slightly different. <laughs> yes, is your, is your video ready? I think so. If not, we'll go I hope it's it. on here. My, I'm getting next to <laughs> <laughs> Dior made, um, this is about appropriation, and uh, I had a very specific example about Dior, that it's the Scaramusa collection that was uh, made last year. Scaramusas are the, 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 the women that ride horses in Mexico, and it's the, the most, so if you are Mexican, you know the charros, and they're the ones that hold the flag at the end of every, um, you know, um, desfile, and, and, and we all uh, feel, you know, like uh, the charros, no? And um, so it was made, um, uh, it was the Dior um, made it, not in Mexico, obviously, and it became a scandal, which was very strange because the scandal came because of Jennifer Lawrence being the model, which for me was very interesting. Oh, there it is. It was very interesting because it was not how it was made. It was the, it was the blonde model representing a Mexican. And um, so these, um, this is the Dior collection um, in Mexico, only for the bow that it's made in, with rebozo. You have the 13 different hands. Then we will go um, the faja that is also made with rebozo. That will be another 13 hands. And for me, it's very, I mean, it's crazy to see a Adelita or a Scaramusa saying Christian Dior Paris, you know? It's like, it's like, what's going on? And then you see the hats are beach hats. You know how they move? And it's like, it's crazy. It's like, this is not it, you know? And uh, so everything is like, completely different from what it has to be, you know? The flowers must be embroidered by hand, the hat is handmade, and it had to stay because look at those hats, how they're like not working. <laughs> the rebozo, uh, no, <laughs> has to be another way. And they had so much scandal of making Jennifer Lawrence that they came to Mexico, hired seven amazing photographers that obviously they were not into how this was working. And um, this is the, the charros, and they have like different dresses. So you have the leather fretwork that you saw before. It's amazing, and it's handmade, and when people see it, they cannot understand why this is uh, still being handmade. And um, it is like that because we understand that crafts take time and they give work, you know, and they give culture to all of us. And I understand that Dior or Galliano or, you know, the haute couture understands that as well. You see the haute couture in France. Um, so I think around with the horse equipment and with uh, all the charro, just one suit that takes about a month or a month and a half or two months, only for the, for the women, because the horse takes like Six times, so six months at least. You're giving work to more than 50 people. So the question is, why would Dior make this by machine? You know, is it because they want to do it exactly the same? Because they don't want their garments to smell of a smoke? Because our garments smell of a smoke. Because the women are weaving besides the smoke, taking care of their kids and taking care of their community. And it has happened to us a lot of the time that we cannot export to the U.S. because of the smell that I r truly believe is the most fantastic smell that could ever be, <laughs> you know? So it's all against these, uh, you know, everything is made that we don't go through, you know? So I, for me, as a person that works with indigenous communities, how am I gonna pay taxes of the 
of what the women, of what when I buy from these women that made everything from the earth. For me, it's much cheaper to buy a very expensive silk from Italy. So we also had to intervene in public politics to change all that, and it's a complete fight. And our next book, it's called, it's already written, it's called The Manifesto of Fashion as Resistance. And that's the way it has to be. I mean, I don't get other way. Now, fashion is like the second most polluting industry of the world, and for every machine, or for every robot that comes into one, uh, replaces, it's like six jobs are lost. And I don't want that, and um, we'll keep, sorry, we truly believe that the future is handmade, and we are here. I am a facilitator only. I wish I was, I had like the, um, and I wish, you know, Juana would be here speaking for herself, and I'm just a facilitator. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do you have questions or comments? There's a question over there. Um, going off of what you last said about how Dior didn't use the Native women to do the um, craft that they've been doing for a while, does it kind of also like riffs on couture because couture is that hand craftsmanship from what I understand and yes. so would it would you consider all of your all the um, communities that you're working with couture artists or couture designers in a way because of the fact that it is so handmade still and it is really valuing the construction of the designs not just the designs themselves Yes, as we've been addressing like the problems of, not problems, but semiotics and how it's been, when you adopt the term haute couture, it's, I mean, it's, and, and, and Florence can tell you more about it. It's very specific and it has to be made in a certain way. And, and that's why we start our manifesto that says, I'm gonna read it very easily, which I love Paris, I have to say, but I also have like this, um, we have to stand and to make other ways visible. So we say, one day we woke up and realized we couldn't care less about what happens in Paris. You know? <laughs> because we need to understand that I am Mexican, you know? And, and of course, I mean, when we go to the fairs and the people that know haute couture, they come and it's like, what is this, you know? It's like when you're with an expert or when we go to the folk art market, it's like, what is this, you know? It's haute couture. Yes, it is. And of course, like, um, that's something that I, I didn't say before, but if a small company like ours, we're very small. <laughs> we also say in the manifesto that we're very small, but we're like crickets, that we make a lot of noise. <laughs> 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 and um, Dior could come or, and send some of their team and do it with Mexican artisans, you know, and they can do it. And that's why we expect our clients and we see our client as collectors that are gonna help us to keep these crafts going on and to keep saying to the brands that they also love, like these big brands that you can work with the, with the artisans that you are addressing. Thank you. Um, so Ramona touched on this earlier, but self-expression is kind of a huge part of art and apparel and fashion. And I was wondering, a lot of people use apparel with self-expression. Is it about making this craftsmanship more accessible? Is it less accessible? I mean, without the mass market, how do we give people the opportunity to experience that self-expression through amazing craft? Well, I, that's a good question as well, because now what people say about fast fashion, we tend to say that it's very nice because we give fashion to very young crowds and um, to people that don't have that much money to buy 
something that it's more expensive. But I think that it's very tricky and, um, and brands are very in intelligent and they make you think that. Because, I mean, I can tell what your look and for sure you like vintage clothing and vintage stores and, and you can make yourself an amazing look with not spending money and reusing your things or, or seeing what is the thing that you're going to buy that year that is going to represent your you can play with that you know and uh, so for me it's to buy quality and to buy history and an equilibrium between the rural areas and the cities and to maintain this equilibrium which indigenous communities live with the other way is just, you know, like buying, throwing, buying, throwing, expressing yourself in throwing, in trash, and uh, not, I don't know. We also always say that death to plan obsolescence. Why? So this is becoming a trash world, you know, so it's like full of trash, and we are becoming part of the problem. We are part of the problem. I have a thought. Um, I, I, I assume a lot of people have watched Mary Kondo, um, you know, the closet queen. Um, basically, I'm amazed at how much stuff people have, even people with no money, can have so many clothes. And I, um, I, I, I love the idea to death to planned obsolescence, actually. That would really improve our world greatly. But uh, certainly one of the ways I deal with it is, you know, I really like to, particularly with ceramics, let's say, I really like handmade things. I like to put handmade things in my hand. I, I get depressed with a mass-manufactured white mug with a thing stuck on the outside, you know. So often... Um, Handcrafted ceramics cost a lot more, but I just have a lot less of them. You know, where you might have 20 mugs, you have you you have eight mugs, you wash them a lot. I don't know. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> I, I yeah. So I ha I don't have a lot of handcrafted clothing. I hate to say my apologies. <laughs> um, but in terms of recycling, it's interesting. Stella McCartney, who made these shoes that are vegan actually that's not even leather it's plastic i don't know how hand how ha you can handcraft plastic exactly like there's competing arguments around the environment and around what's politically correct for sure when it comes to materials but um she's very pro recycling and that also seemed and a lot a, a lot of my uh, the jewelers that i think are very interesting are using recycled gold because the mining of gold uses so much water, water that could be actually, you know, giving drinking water to a village or whatever. And um, so I think there are on many, many different fronts strategies to adopt um, to counteract this, you know, large rubbish heap we seem to be, you know, this big mound of trash we, we churn out every day. Another question? Here. <laughs> I have a, it's kind of a two questions. Um, and since I'm referring to Carla, I'm going to go in Spanish and then I'll translate, but it's, it's really short. Yo quisiera saber si para ti, estando dentro de México, tu trabajo está valor, es valorado de la misma manera que, que nosotros desde afuera lo vemos. Y dos, ¿cómo, por qué? Toda Latinoamérica siempre ha visto a México como el gran país, el gran culturalmente, siempre, aun cuando todos lo manejamos. Entonces, ¿por qué el mercado latinoamericano no, 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 tú tienes algo que ver con el mercado latinoamericano llevándote a otros lados? So my question is one, it's uh, if her job, her work, it's the same way seen in Mexico because I think it's a beautiful work. But sometimes, you know, when it's your own, your own work in your own country, people don't value as much because it's taken for granted. And the second, it's for me, I think it's very important as a Latin American from Venezuela. We see Mexico 
has always been a, a beautiful country, extremely rich in culture, in, in art, and in everything else. What, if, if you ever consider taking that beautiful work into Latin, in Latin America, the rest is not only the US, as I said before. America yes. is the whole thing. Okay. Thank you for your question. I'm going to um, uh, answer the first, the second. And uh, it's a very good question. And it has to, it has to do with the politics. Because we had, I don't know how we are now, we had a free trade <laughs> not long time ago. And, uh, and for me to export or import from Latin America, from Mexico down, it's crazy. We actually have, uh, with Guatemala, we, there's a beautiful project called the New Denim Project. They recycle everything by hand, so they don't have to use more water or more uh, chemicals. It's, it got stuck in costumes for six months, and it was so expensive to pay the taxes. We always try to work with Brazilis, forget it. So, uh, it's so crazy expensive, uh, because they're very protectionists of their, of their industry. Colombia as well, Peru. We have tried very hard, and we will keep trying until it happens, because it's both ways. There's amazing uh, designers in Central and South America, and we are trying to do this, but we do it with log our luggages, no? So we go to <laughs> Colombia, they come to Mexico, no? And it's, it's less expensive, it's, it's affordable only to come with the things. So we have to change that. And the other question is that we do have a very good market. We sell half of our clients are Mexican and are local. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I would like to know, how does the creative process work between you and the communities? Because you didn't talk about that. Who actually designs and how, how does that back and forth happen? I'm really interested in that. Well, we, uh, the communities call us to work to do new designs. So we go to the community, we sit down, and we tell them, it's like, bring everything that you do. Bring everything that your great-grandmother did. Everything from, and it's very interesting because a lot of the time it's private. Like in a lot of the communities, the most elaborate craft is on the underskirt, on where you cover the tortillas. So we sit there and it's like, okay, no, bring, bring. <laughs> and um, the creative process in the community it's collective, you know? And sometimes, with time, we understood they were coming and telling us, it's like, oh, yesterday I dreamed about these beautiful uh, women that was standing in a mountain with her long hair blowing. And I understood that she wanted to weave that, but it had to come to dreams, because it's a collectiveness. So every community is different. And we have to understand the community in order to, can, to create together. And we had another, and it's like really like being very aware of how we can work, no? And there was another community that the mothers called us because the young ladies didn't want to weave anymore on the backstrap loom because they were using denim. And I was like, easy, let's do denim in, in backstrap loom, you know? And they were like, perfect. And now the, the, the young girls are making with indigo, which is a fantastic way of making. It's, it's not denim, but it really looks like denim, you know? It's with indigo, and then you have like the, the, waf, the weft with uh, another color, which was the trend. And um, we just... Uh, we just sit down, listen, and then we discuss. It's like, what do you think? I was like, oh, we would like to wear denim. OK. No, and you just like accompany the talk. Do you, do you have the, any of your, sorry, just quickly, do you have any of your input? Like, you travel around the world, you go to all these places, and do you bring back things from the world, and then you? Well, we for uh -huh. Mm, yes, I mean, I travel all the world. I travel a lot. Um, and yes, we, but we don't follow the trends. So we know the trends, 
but I don't go to the community and tell them, the trend now is yellow and blue. You know? <laughs> but, and, and you know, but we have to change because it takes us so much time to make one product that we need to change for the following for another color. And they understand that because we need to renew that same garment. Because we have garments that have taken us, we have been selling the same garment 10 years, but we just changed the color, you know? But I don't know. And we have a methodology to work in, in the patterning and also. Can I ask a question? Um, uh, I'm wondering why you chose to use to create the brand Carla Fernandez uh. when it's about community creativity because you could have chosen I mean there are many brand names yes. that are not an individual's name see that was a mistake and I was <laughs> <laughs> no, because my brand was called Taller Flora that is spelled T-A-L-L-E-R Flora and then in, when you are young and you want to, I mean, I didn't study fashion. So I went with people that were very fashion and knowledge, or I don't know how you say, and they say, Carla, you're making a mistake. Taller Flora doesn't work. Um, you know, um, it's spelled like taller Flora. People are looking for someone. And you have, to, and, and people always say like Carla Fernandez, Carla Fernandez, and I always say of my my name, which I really believe in, my name as as a, like Juan Valdez. I'm very happy that I have a very common name, you know, like you know whatever, you know. And uh, but I think it, I, I mean I know Taller Flora, and then and then I follow, and I always keep thinking that I should go back to Taller Toller Flora. <laughs> but the workshops are called Taller Flora. Do, do you think the, the, the new fashion uh, process that you have invented can be reproduced around the world, can be something that perhaps would be the future of fashion? But I don't think I invented it. I think it, it's there, you know? I think it's just uh, something that um, we just made some, so we have like bumps and we just go and pass all of us like that bump and we learn from a lot of brands around the world mm -hmm. and um, yes I think uh, that's why we do exhibitions that's why we do books that's why we do magazines we do videos so I, I am an art historian and I know uh, that we have to I know the power of sharing knowledge and uh, that's why because I didn't study fashion so I'm obsessed uh, and I'm um, and as a Mexican, you have to make yourself, you know? So it's like you learn by falling and, 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 and standing up. But I think it's, uh, yes, so I think, and in the communities, it works. For example, in, uh, when you sell, there's, there's a model of business that you, you don't pay but it's like when you give someone in a retailer store and they only pay you when you sell. So it's consignment, right? Consignment. Okay. In our book says consignment kills the community, also like the traditional work. And then we were, and we do these talks in the communities. So we will go and do the talks in the communities with translators. And, and then a lady called me that has a store. It's like, Carla. These ladies from no, Mazatlán don't want to sell me anymore in consignment. It's like, yes, perfect, because they saw your <laughs> talk in the Highlands. And it's like, yes, perfect, they shouldn't. Why are you not paying them, you know, in advance? So that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's a problem that uh, many young uh, fashion designers that I know uh, we are facing, you know, yes. very often. They were not paid and, and then they had no money to produce. No, it's crazy. I mean, just there are a lot of artists that use this model. Um, I mean, Boetti famously um, <laughs> created these weavings, and he would, you know, send the designs to Pakistan, and they'd be done. Mm -hmm. He didn't have the close relationship, mm -hmm. um, and I, there, I don't think the creative input did appear mm -hmm. in the work because 
they would choose colors and they would make decisions. Well, even more than that, and actually I have him written down to talk about. Okay, go ahead, because Becky. Because what he did is he left open spaces in his designs. His designs were all, uh, uh, not the maps, but the, the letter designs, they were, um, uh, they, they took there were they were adages and then the areas that joined each separated each sentence was left blank mm. and the weaver could do whatever they it's an embroidery embroiderer could do whatever they want and so in, as a result a number of these came back and went into the U European and American markets with uh, with um, Farsi writing mm -hmm. because they were made in Pakistan. And it's really fascinating because the women actually got to put their own sayings into these textiles. And those are worth lots and lots of money these days because of the agency of the women who made them. Although those women probably have they, they never got money. they never got a cent. It, well, they, well, they, they were, were paid, paid for their labor. They were paid I mean, for labor. And I think also Ai Weiwei, um, when he was making his sunflower seeds uh, for his huge installations where there'd be like millions of these little porcelain sculptures, he actually very consciously, conscientiously went to villages that were ceramic villages, that had been ceramic villages for centuries, and that they were actually losing, they had no more business because it had all been shifted into factories, and he, you know, kept them, this cottage industry alive for several years making mm -hmm. um, his sunflower That's seeds. Good. Yeah. But I, I have to say something, I live with an artist. And, um, and I see the difference between art and fashion. Fashion is crazy difficult and, and craft. For example, we have a commitment that it's, um, we make collections and we do, even if it's summer and it's 40 degrees, we change our wool to accessories or to home. But we always work together with the same artisans, as long as, obviously, they want to work with us. And, um, and that's why we have uh, compadres and friends that we've been working for the last 20 years together. And in art, I understand that there is, um, you make series and then the series, no? Or, or you have to complete, but, or you have like, a, like artisans that you work with for example, Pedro works with artisans, but it's not as um, way way you said that he stopped doing the, the seeds, no? I don't know if he's still we're, making seeds or not, actually. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. But I, th we're, we're, I think this problem with fashion happened quite recently in the history of humanity. It's from the 19th century. You know, with the machine. Yes. The machine brought the idea. You you had to f to feed the machine. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, then it it means that you have to create collection uh, twice a year and then four times a year. To today, it's ten times a yes, year. It's crazy. You know. Then, the, the difficulty when you are working with uh, we were brewers and uh, there is a lot of time and requirement to do. Mm -hmm. In the Dior exhibition, there are two uh, dresses that are made with ikat. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, and in the movie, which is uh, showing the, the process of the whole collection, you see the, the, the woman in charge of creating this, this fabric. She's desperate mm -hmm. because she has just one month yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to deal with this. The problem of fashion is this schedule that was set in the 19th century. Yes, no, and then you see videos or movies like the Alexander McQueen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. that is crazy. And unfortunately, John's about to <laughs> shoo us off stage. <laughs> I'm the bad guy. Um, I just want to thank you all for your contributions today.